So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to Performing Tangier Festival, and this is one of the big moments of the festival. So, we have with us, you know, it's an honor to host online, you know, Richard Schechner, one of the founders of Performance Studies, is one, he is a professor and theorist and performance theorist, theater director, author, and editor of TDR, and also enactment book series. So, professor of performance studies, as I already mentioned, and uh, Schechner combines his work in performance theory with innovative approaches to the broad spectrum of performance studies, including theater, play, ritual, dance, music, popular entertainment, sports, politics, performance in everyday life, etc. In order to understand performative behavior, not just as an object of study, but also as an active artistic intellectual practice. So I'm extremely delighted to have Richard Schechner with us today. And of course, the occasion, it's precisely, you know, TDR Arabic, which is an innovative project. As you know, we have an exclusive agreement with TDR and Richard Schechner, you know, to translate, you know, uh, articles from the core of TDR all over, you know, the, the years. And we are selecting actually articles in order to translate them into Arabic. And it, I'm extremely happy to have, you know, uh, like the second issue, at least a draft of it today uh, uh, on stage right here. So the first issue is this one. And of course, it's available and you can uh, uh, have access to it, of course, online and also, you know, the hard copy. But of course, today we are launching also the second issue, which is on the way. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Richard. And of course, I'll, I'll start maybe with one major uh, uh, question. So if, for example, the avant-garde theory of theater silenced theater questions of origins and authenticity in the West and beyond, of course, many years ago, now performance studies seems to be still grappling with the very term it has come to foster performance itself as a label and as a, as a, as a name. In his TDR command, John McKenzie, for example, admits the dominance of English informs and deforms the very concept of performance and by exten uh, extension the very objects studied as performance. And of course for her part, Johnny Reynald, uh, taking part in such an e extended mediation on how to negotiate, for example, performances, blind spots, its aporias, its exclusions rightly states, you know, that I do not think, or rather I do think, sorry, it's a variable term for scholarship that aspires to be international, even as I have serious doubts about the specific term performance studies because of its tendency to be presented and perceived as a primarily Anglo-American disciplinary formation and because of the charges of imperialism that are sometimes led at its door. So in light of all these, I know that this is a debate that was already inscribed in, in one of the issues of TDR and I really respect the way you deal with it, the way you deal with the uh, uh, difference also I mean, uh, uh, even uh, uh, people who are opposing some uh, uh, issues or let's say have issues with some concepts like the broad s spectrum, you welcome them to write and of course to publish in TDR 
and of course um, uh, I was fascinated also by your response so Richard if you can just put us in the picture about all these uh, 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 issues related to performance studies where it is taking us today and particularly that you have disciples all over the world now in China, in, 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 in Morocco, in, in, in Japan, in Africa and other parts of the world. So I give you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Khalid. I uh, want to begin by saying I'm sorry that I'm not there in my flesh, but because of uh, the communication we can have through Zoom, I am really present with you. And I wish you very much uh, success in the conference. I've listened to quite a bit of it already in the last few days. And I th thank Khalid Amin not only for inviting me, but for being uh, the editor of TDR Arabic, a very important thing. I'll start with a, with a word to uh, answer and discuss the question of whether performance studies is imperialistic or neo-colonial as the uh, uh, what you were quoting from the uh, forum we had in in TDR some years ago which asked the question is performance studies uh, imperialistic uh, the word is algebra it's an Arabic word I believe and it is uh, one of the great uh, contributions to uh, global knowledge uh, we we well know that the uh, numer numeric system that was used by the Romans was very clumsy and then the Arabs brought in a system of one two three four five six seven eight nine and the Indians I believe added a zero I may have it a little bit mixed up but basically uh, mathematics as we know it in the world today is not a Western invention it's an Arabic uh, invention uh, uh, augmented by an Indian invention and yet no one would say that mathematics or uh, the, all the sciences that came from mathematics is an imperialistic imposition of the superior uh, uh, Arabic or Islamic uh, or Middle Eastern culture although that culture was certainly dominant for many hundreds of years uh, from you know or seventh or eighth century uh, right through the so-called dark ages of Europe and uh, into the uh, you know it, it survived it survives it's, it's vital today and it was dominant uh, pretty late on uh, I guess what I'm saying is that the history of the human cultures has been a history of uh, globalization uh, not called such, but the history of the exchange of ideas and cultures from the very beginning, as long as, as far back as we can reach. Uh, not only is uh, mathematics uh, a non-Western invention, but very, very useful to uh, people like Newton and Einstein. Uh, but then we have, of course, the question of Italy and pasta, nothing could be more Italian than pasta except that pasta is Chinese I uh, what I'm saying is that at each age at each epoch uh, uh, certain uh, you know we, we can we can say that we've certain uh, cultural uh, uh, engines uh, seem to impose themselves on other cultures and then in the next epoch that's kind of uh, if not forgotten it's been absorbed and used so we're living now, uh, still, in the uh, aftermath of uh, European uh, or Western uh, and uh, the heir to the West, in, in this sense, American expansion and colonialism and neo-colonialism. So we're still in the shadow, shadow of that. And uh, along with that, of course, uh, came the uh, spread of the uh, English language on the uh, ships and wings of, uh, of Britain and the British Empire, uh, which was a seafaring empire, and it reached, as you well know, all the way uh, to India and beyond and uh, into Africa 
etc. Et, et and uh, that language was carried there and it continues to, to be used uh, and, and has, uh, it began by imposing itself, of course, uh, but it later was uh, accepted by many people as a kind of international language. We still use it in, in that way. Uh, my project with you, uh, TDR Arabic, and with Sun Wei Zhu in Shanghai, TDR China, and in process in uh, Malayalam, Southwest uh, uh, India, Kerala, TDR Malayalam, which is not yet uh, realized, but will is in the process, and hopefully there will be others as well, is to uh, uh, destabilize uh, to some degree the hegemony of English by allowing the ideas that are in TDR that originally were published in English to be available in, in other languages. The deeper question is, are these ideas themselves in whatever language uh, imperialistic? Is the notion of uh, performance, the notion of the broad spectrum, which is my term, imperialistic? I can't really answer that question. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it back to you to some degree. If you feel this, do you feel that these ideas are useful in, in a world uh, which uh, I think needs more performance analysis. I'll, I'll read something uh, that I was going to read from Anthony Arto, who was a, uh, 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 let's say, a, a globalist uh, to some degree. He was French, of course. He was also deeply disturbed. He was uh, very influenced by what he saw of Balinese dancers, but he saw the Balinese dancers in a, quote, colonial exposition, unquote when they were brought to or sent to Paris and he saw them perform. And what Achto wrote uh, certainly has had a, a huge impact on the theater of the 60s and beyond. And we still live to some degree in Achto's sh shadow. I'm just going to read this one thing about uh, one paragraph of his theater of cruelty. And I think that connects to what we're talking to about. On page 80 in the English translation of his theater and, it, and its double, Le Théâtre en son double, it's in French, I'm sure, that in Morocco, where I feel there's Arabic spoken and French is probably the second major uh, language there rather than English, you know uh, Le Théâtre en son double. Well, here, theater of cruelty means a theater difficult and cruel for myself, first of all. And on the level of performance, it is not the cruelty we can exercise upon each other by hacking at each other's bodies, carving up our personal anatomies, or like Assyrian emperors, sending parcels of human ears, noses, or neatly detached nostrils through the mail, but the much more terrible and necessary cruelty which things can exercise against us. We are not free and the sky can still fall on our heads. And the theater has been created to teach us that first of all. So that is a great lesson, I think. I'll repeat that last sentence. We are not free and the sky can still fall on our heads. And the theater has been created to teach us that first of all. I feel that increasingly in the uh, twilight of uh, the age of imperialism, in the uh, epoch as we move towards some new uh, world system uh, we have also uh, found that uh, people are uh, more extreme in their beliefs than they were let's say when I was a young man when I was 30 or 40 years old even though they were very extreme beliefs but there's uh, so many uh, people who are uh, so extreme in their beliefs that they cannot talk to one another and instead they go to war against one another and uh, the uh, rise in uh, violence uh, is is it's it's kind of like a, a a world war without a world war in other words it's not a great power world war it's the world at war through many wars and i don't need to detail them to you and what can performance do this what is our role as artists 
not our role as, as citizens, not our role, you know, in, in, in that direct political way, but as, as artists, uh, in, in Artaud's way. It is, I think, a double role, and I think here's where performance can be very helpful. It is the role to uh, recognize that the sky can fall on our heads and to do the kind of theater that can explore that, you know, whether it's the Trojan women or the Bachi, which I did of Euripides, or it's a new play or something. But it's also, and I think deeply processual, to bring people together in what I would call a rehearsal mode. How good it would be if we all could be together in a rehearsal mode. What is a rehearsal mode? A rehearsal mode is where you don't know exactly what the outcome is going to be. You don't really uh, 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 put to death somebody who disagrees with you. You try out this and that. You uh, entertain all kinds of possibilities in the service of a project that you're not even sure is going to uh, what it's going to be as you uh, enter into the rehearsal mode. Uh, all of us who have done theater know what that's like. Sometimes it's very scary to be in rehearsal mode. You don't know exactly if you're a director or a performer what you're going to do the next day. You're not sure what the quote product is going to be. The quote production, a very interesting word in in uh, in English, uh, you know, a, 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 a quite a capitalist word, a product, a production, uh, but. Uh, 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 the rehearsal mode is provisional. The rehearsal mode is asks questions. The rehearsal mode brings people together in order to explore possibilities. I would love to see our world leaders be in a rehearsal mode rather than in a, a constant uh, production. I would like to see them, you know, explore all the possibilities, hear each other. The other thing that performance can do is that it can be compassionate. It can ask questions rather than raise, uh, uh, give definite and definitive answers. So I feel that when we, when we bring into our personal lives and we bring into our social lives and we bring into our communal lives the, these uh, uh, performance processes, we uh, it, it help the world along. As you well know, uh, Khalid, and maybe some others, several years back, I, I wrote an essay called The New Third World of Performance, and I was taking off, it's kind of an answer to uh, 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 John McKenzie. I was taking off from, uh, actually I call it The New Fourth World of Performance, from Nehru's great uh, speech, uh, you know, shortly after uh, India became independent, he, he, he said, you know, the world now has two great warring uh, uh, groups. At that point, it was the Soviet Union and communism. Uh, China had just uh, uh, turned, uh, uh, been taken, you know, Mao had just won the Civil War, and so China was also communist, but he was speaking mostly of the Soviet Union. And on the other side, the NATO nations, which still exist as NATO and the United States, and he says that's the two worlds but let us constitute a third world, said Nehru, a world that was not aligned with either the, quote, East or West. And this third world, of course, we still have the term, the third world from NATO from half a century back. And at that point, he was talking really about uh, India and, and Asia and uh, emerging Africa. Africa had not emerged as strongly back then as it has, as it is now. Uh, you know, a, a great uh, a region of, of great cultural diversity and uh, natural and human resources. And what I proposed was the fourth world and the fourth world of performance, which is a world which constitutes itself of people like uh, are gathered there with you in, in Tangier and in many places of the world. We're not a geographic world. We are a world of uh, uh, feel-alikes, think-alikes, a, a world uh, we don't constitute a majority anywhere. We don't carry uh, guns, but we are a, a strong voice 
almost everywhere, or we try to be. Some places our voices are stifled, but we try to be a voice, and we can constitute a, a, a creative rehearsal mode balance and alternative to the first, second, third, however many socio-political worlds you want to name. So that is what, to some degree, I've uh, devoted much of my life to, to conceptualizing and bringing into existence this fourth world. Uh, oh, well, not bringing into, uh, uh, that's too, uh, I don't want to suffer from hubris. Uh, I did not bring it into existence. I'm discussing it. I'm trying to categorize it. I'm, I'm trying to help contribute towards it. And the idea is that, I guess it's based on the principle that at one time or another, almost every culture was imperialistic in relationship to its neighbors, sometimes close by, and to uh, places that were uh, distant. You look anywhere you want and you see that happening, or it has happened. And uh, I, I'm saying that in, in all times also there have been shamans and artists and so on who form a kind of other way of knowledge and being than the ways of economics or the ways of guns or any kinds of weapons uh, they form or the ways of religion actually although performance of course has been used by all these things you can have political performance you can have religious or ritual performance and you can have economic or popular entertainment performance but i i think i you know that's that's how i would answer that uh, question khalid yeah thank you very much Rich, uh, richard that uh, the answer was so intense and uh, in, uh, you know uh, inclusive also <coughs> let me start with the very first uh, indication about w which is quite similar to Erika Fischer Lichter's you know notion of the interweaving of performance cultures so like uh, the contribution of Arabs for example to the Western you know uh, knowledge you, you mentioned the, the example of numbers coming from India and Far East and then developed and also the Khawarizmi and the logarithm and and uh, I, I feel very much you know like uh, you know, there is a demarcating date for us in the Arab world and the Arab Islamic world, which is the fall of Granada, 1492. So yes. what happened? What happened there is that you know, all of a sudden, we were uh, our contributions to the human history was uh, edited out and uh, uh, you know attempts to erase it completely in philosophy, medicine, and and uh, algebra, as you mentioned, and other. Uh, uh, fields, and this is due to the you know the, the West world was so busy with the new expansion West world in in America with the discovery of America, and I think this is the beginning uh, like of an era of uh, uh, I would call it uh, coloniality uh, following you know Mignolo and others. So uh, and uh, our problem with that precisely is that the very uh, moment when modernity came over and of course was expanded in our part of the world it came also with it you know coloniality and that's why it's uh, we ha we are skeptical towards you know uh, the dominance of let's say western knowledge and things like yes. this in different fields you know yes but that's that's one wave uh, 1492 was an extraordinarily important year <laughs> terrible year yeah. The Arabs, uh, you know, Islam was uh, thrown out of Spain, as it were. And uh, 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 the sorry, Jews were also expelled from Spain in 1492. And sorry and to interrupt, Richard. Sorry to interrupt. It, it was, it was, uh, it was like the Sephardic Jewish tradition and the Islamic yes. tradition. Yes, both. Uh, that's what I'm saying. 1492 <laughs> was a bad year for both the uh, uh, Arabic and Sephardic. I mean. It, it, it actually yes and and it was the start of uh, western colonialism but if we go back you know to another founding event in islamic culture what happened on the plains of karbala uh you know just uh, two generations after the prophet where hussein was martyred uh or uh, surrounded and defeated in a battle in uh, karbala today's iraq 
And that started the split between Shia and Sunni, a split that still exists in the Islamic world. Uh, uh, or, or if we think of the Protestant Reformation, which came not too long after 1492, Martin Luther began in about 1540, you know, uh, 50 years later, and rejected the, uh, uh, I, I seem to have disappeared there. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, I can't see, oh, there we are. So, uh, Martin Luther began at about that time, so, and that started the split in Christianity between uh, 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 Protestant and Catholic. And earlier, of course, you talk about Granada, but we can talk about Constantinople and then Istanbul and the, uh, and the uh, 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 split between the Eastern and Western Roman Empire. I guess what I'm saying is, if we look at the history of the Northern Hemisphere, leaving India and China out for the moment, but I can get there in, a mo in, in some time, and Japan, we see these this kind of wave back and forth, back and forth, at certain for hundreds of years. Uh, 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 oh, I was I was talking about Karbala. Uh, sh after that, Islam, which of course began uh, 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 historically in the what is now Saudi Arabia in in the Arab you know in that in that region uh, there expanded uh, globally across across the world you know so that the largest Islamic population in the world is not in the Middle East it's uh, Indonesia and Indonesian I Islam is quite a bit different uh, in its practices in its culture uh, it, 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 it it features in its uh, Wayan Kulit, its puppetry, uh, figures from Hindu mythology, etc., etc. I mean, Islam is extraordinarily widely diversified, both in its practice and in and its population. Uh, it also expanded, sometimes peacefully and sometimes by force. I guess what I'm saying is that if we take a broader view of history, this the idea of colonialism is not a Western invention and if we look at the uh, histories of uh, the uh, groups in africa and how their kingdoms uh, expanded and exchanged or if we look at the uh, history of china very interesting history of china since china was ruled uh, uh, was not united uh, it, it became united quite early but it was united under different uh, imperial uh, edicts it still you know is a uh, a struggle between the Han Chinese and other uh, kinds of uh, 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 Chinese about who is going to be the, uh, the the ruling group. Is it in Nanjing, which is southern capital, or Beijing, which is northern capital, etc., etc. Wherever we look in the world, Khalid, we see that this pattern is there. I think performances, uh, uh, I guess what I would like to see is an evolution not to end these kind of waves of expansion and conflict. Uh, I don't I don't think that's possible. I think that's very deeply baked into who we are as human beings. But we can do it nonviolently. It's not that Gandhi and Mandela and Martin Luther King were against struggle. They were against violent struggle. They were against physical harm. They knew the power of persuasion. They knew the power of performance. When Gandhi decided to protest the tax on salt that the British colonialists imposed on him, what did he do? He didn't throw a bomb. He said he's going to walk 300 kilometers or so to the sea and get water and get salt from the water. It's called the Salt March. And he showed how that could be done. When Martin Luther King, uh, uh, interesting name, you know, the great uh, uh, man in uh, African-American uh, culture, one of the great men in African-American culture, wanted to protest segregation, he did not throw a bomb. He decided to cross a bridge, or Rosa May Parks earlier decided to sit in the front of the bus, you know, and these, these gestures, these performances, crossing the Petty Bridge, and meeting Bull Connor's dogs, and and not answering those dogs and those fire hoses with wa of of water and brutality by 
uh, uh, armed resistance, but by nonviolence. Those really changed people's minds. They changed people's hearts. They were performances. They were they were uh, of great force and power. Similarly, Nelson Mandela in uh, South Africa. So we do have models. Uh, it seems at some time, and I must say I'm uh, I'm concerned at our present time. We forget those models and we reach for the bomb or the gun uh, too soon uh, or, or at all instead of other means. So it's not, I'm not uh, saying we can, we will all live in peace and harmony. Mm -hmm. I'm saying the means of conflict have to become more theatrical and less uh, 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 physical. Uh, I, I've, I've also uh, written uh, an essay, I don't know if you're going to translate it, uh, uh, called uh, 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 Postpone the Great Game. That's the one that comes after the new fourth it's world. The, it's in the second issue. Okay, so you know in that, in that uh, 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 essay, I analyze the war uh, in the Ukraine and I compare it, this was before the uh, war that we now have in Gaza, I compare the war in Ukraine to what uh, the struggle between uh, Russia and Britain over Afghanistan, which was called the Great Game, uh, and it was a, 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 to some degree a, a, a performance of this of, of this struggle. But I I I analyze it. If it's there, your your readers can read it. I propose that we make war a game. Uh, I, I would love to abolish war, but. Short of that, I'd rather have it a game with real consequences. We know that the world can come together and play games where rivalries are important. We have the Olympics, and we have uh, 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 smaller Olympics in various parts of the world, and we have the large Olympics. We have other sports things, et cetera, et cetera. So there are ways of nonviolently combating, and these are all Absolutely. analyzable and understandable as performances. And what do I mean by performance? I mean actions who, uh, whose semiotics is to send a message, not simply to accomplish something, but to show and demonstrate something. I think I should stop there. I mean, we're about halfway through our time, and uh, I'd like to deal with as many questions as possible, and hopefully perhaps some people in your audience there might have some questions for me also. Yeah, but uh, that was so enlightening too, you know. Uh, I, I just would like to go back to the Granada thing, why I mentioned, uh, you know, the 1492 as a demarcating history uh, in the Arabo-Islamic tradition, particularly in North Africa. And that's because, you know, it, it was like the demise of all of a sudden of uh, an, uh, let's say, an Arabo-Islamic civilization in, in Andalus or in Europe, actually. And then the rise of another you know era which is the coloniality and the matrix of power that 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 is still going on and giving us today what is called you know uh, let's say neo-colonialism etc uh, uh, when you bring it back to performance studies and particularly to what we are doing and what we are talking about we feel you know some of us in the arab islamic tradition feel like skeptical towards everything coming from the west in, in terms of theory as well as a theater, as a jargon, as a lexicon, as a practice. And they are asking and to go back to the roots, etc. And that's because it's, it was not a normal exchange. It was, you know, like an exchange that was imposed by the colonial machine starting from Napoleon up till today. So, and, and this colonial matrix of power is what created this uh, idea of uh, decolonial options, or maybe at the beginning post-colonial and today decolonial options. You know, thinking about other ways of thinking rather than than uh, uh, the Western uh, uh, way. And when I go back to the the global spectrum that you proposed, it's for me it's so impressive. And of course, y you are asking us also to search in the local, you know, tradition, our tradition, to to look for other uh, means of doing research and practicing, you know, performance itself. So it's really 
uh, uh, pushing us into a liminal space itself, the global spectrum. And, and for me, I find it extremely helpful because it's an invitation, like Khatibi's double critique, and like Mignolo's border thinking, you know, to think in both ways and from none positions, you know, to think between the West and the East at the same time. Correct. But uh, th there are more players now than, you know, we're, we're, it, we're in a kind of post-colonial and neoliberal uh, world. There, there are, you know, uh, 50 years ago, uh, uh, India and China were on the geographic map. Your conference is called Geographies of Knowledge. But India and China were not uh, major uh, global powers. India and China are now major global powers. India is actually now, I think, the most populous. It's got more people than uh, than uh, China, and they're they are very powerful uh, presences. Uh, the Chinese presence in in Africa probably rivals, if doesn't s supersede, the Western European uh, 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 presence there. And these cultures also introduce. Uh, value systems that I think we'll see as we move through the 21st and into the 22nd century. And I want to talk about whether we're going to get there or not, some problems we have. But assuming that we were going to get there, we're going to see that some of the ideas that are in uh, uh, classical Indian thought, uh, uh, such as the Bhagavad Gita, the stories of the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, and I've done a lot of work in India, these these ideas, these stories will be uh, uh, globalized as well. And from China, we have, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is a really cultural performance uh, uh, and an economic performance, a strategy, you know, uh, it kind of says uh, what uh, uh, Xi Ping and really uh, Deng Xiaoping before him, because that's really where it comes. It comes in the uh, generation right after Mao from from especially Deng Xiaoping there uh, the idea was that the West uh, the colonial the former colonial Western powers uh, kind of conceived of NATO North Atlantic Treaty Organization which was a military which is a military alliance and the Chinese thought of this Belt and Road Initiative which is a which is a economic and and cultural alliance so I think we're going to see a much different world emerging and at the same time uh, we're talking about these things and we're faced with the enormous challenges uh, uh, at, a, at a global level I'm talking about what I would I call the four horsemen of the new apocalypse uh, climate change uh, pollution species extinction and population uh, uh, when I was uh, a young man, there were like uh, two billion people on the in the world. There are now eight billion people, four times in one lifetime, and uh, we know that the species are being exterminated, extinguished uh, at a great rate. We know that we are polluting uh, our, our our world, and uh, we know that uh, climate change is going to come. They just had the COP. 28 meeting it was another one of those meetings where there was a lot of talk but not that much action and this is going to unleash enormous uh, chaos on the world i don't think human life is going to come to an end or life on the planet i think gaia the planet will take care of itself but i do think it will be an enormous stress especially on the global south which is now a category which uh, you know we, if you look back 40 30 years there was no word phrase global south and i want to know i mean i'm proposing what artists what we can do about these about these things how we can help our ourselves and our fellow human beings meet these i don't think we have the time to fight wars against each other when we need to come together to deal with these uh, processes uh, which actually we created ourselves. In other words, uh, the other, it, you, you're talking about the socioeconomic and cultural uh, uh, outflow from colonialism. And, and that 
that era. So let's let's call that era what it really is. It's the colonial industrial era era because colonialism was finally driven by trade and trade was driven by industry, you know, everything that came from the factory system, the steam engine on through to nuclear power and so on and and the rise of oil. I mean, if you talk uh, and fossil fuels uh uh, where uh, the uh, you know what the the preponderance of those fossil fuels or a great amount of them lie in the Arabic uh, countries, of course, uh, uh, and and so this is all in mesh. So we're 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 we we need to we need to uh, look at these. We we need to put aside some of our. Uh, we need to learn how to put aside some of our uh, infighting to deal with these problems that we've created. Uh, and that cannot be just laid at the doorstep of London or Washington or Berlin or or or, or, or Riyadh or Tangier or Casablanca. You know, they're not, they're at, they're at many many different doorsteps now. And I think that if we keep thinking in terms of uh, colonial neo colonial, we, we keep thinking in those uh, I consider quickly becoming outmoded terms. We are going to suffer the consequences. Of not really thinking uh, 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 more I interculturally and uh, and globally in a healthy in a healthy way, performatively, if you will, uh, and use performance as a real tool to get us to where we need to be. And uh, by the way, you know, uh, one major, you know, I would say, uh, think about, you know. Uh, having access to the core of Cambridge University Press, you know, TDR, is that we, we were able to select articles exclusively related to the climate change for the second uh, issue. So Terrific. Yeah. Terrific. By the way, you can also use the MIT articles. I've cleared that, so you can use anything. Oh, thank you. It's good to know. <laughs> yes. So, what so, the all of, all of TDR, so I want to ask you a question, Khalid. Yes, yes, please. So, why in light of what you've been discussing, why do you want to do TDR Arabic? Why do you want to bring, you know, why do you want to bring this quote Western thought or whatever you want to call it into Arabic? Why do you want to do it? Uh, uh, because I, I believe, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the, let's say the, the crazy rooming of around a lost self shall never steer it up from dust. Uh, in other words, you know, uh, this nostalgic quest for for an authentic and original thing that, that uh, you know, uh, is leading us to crazy identities. And I, I yes. truly believe that we need to have a, a proper dialogue and we need to have a conversation, uh, a real, in the real sense of the word, conversation with the other, with, uh, with you know, because, you know, in Heideggerian term, even the construction of the self is based on, <laughs> On, on on this you know other so the other is part of me you know I should never uh, uh, so the West for me is dialogue should remain but of course in terms of politics we have to be cautious how to decolonize you know the the the, the hegemony but right. not going away in order to to adopt a crazy identity right. that that goes right. back to nowhere. Yes, I would like to add that this is part of my new fourth world of performance. That everywhere I'm not, I, don't, I you know obviously I am structurally Westerner. I'm structurally colonial, whatever. But I'm not personally that way. You know, I'm not an, an industrialist. I'm not a, uh, uh, you know. And everywhere you can find people who are not in line with the political social orthodoxy of their so-called uh, leaders or their nations or what have you. And those that forms a huge community, a huge community of people that, that we, we need to, uh, uh, you know, get, keep in touch with, perform with, inquire with, connect. That's why I consider my connection here to you and, and my meeting with you, Khalid, and with the other people, so, so very, very important. And is that Dario? Yeah. Hi, Richard. Good to see come you. Come in, come in. Ciao, Dario. Ciao, Richard. 
Ciao Richard, good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. How are things in Sicily? Uh, fine. And you're in New, York, you're in New York in Manhattan? I'm in Manhattan. I'm uh, in 70 East 10th Street. Uh, and it is uh, 6 in the morning. Uh, 6 in the morning. <laughs> I hope to meet you here. But anyway, another time, another occasion. Another time. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, uh, one last thing uh, about this, you know, uh, the notion of the fourth world uh, word that you, uh, you know, you, you know, you, you talked about in your essay, it's really uh, part of this uh, global, uh, the global self. Because, you know, uh, the global, uh, in terms of mapping, you know, mapping is power. But the global south, it's not really about north-south division, it's beyond that. You know, it's like creating communities, you know, the thinking, uh, it's like a coalition of different powers, different uh, constituencies in all over the world, from Berlin, exactly. from New York, from Tangier, from, you know, Riyadh, from uh, Shanghai, and of course to work together, and this togetherness is the, the, the most important thing. Exactly, exactly. TDR itself, as you know, is a consortium of universities one of which is the Shanghai Theater Academy. And, you know, uh, I'm in the midst of there, the, the, the struggle at the, at the upper political levels, China and the United States are, are uh, you know, trying to create a new Cold War. Uh, and at the level that I work at, I want to maintain uh, uh, dialogic relationships. I want to maintain contact. I want to maintain exchange. Uh, th that's always always the better road. I want to ask Absolutely. questions rather than uh, always answer them. Yes, and uh, the the Richard Schechner Center is based there. I yes, it's based in Shanghai at the Shanghai Theater Academy, okay. and it it is what publishes TDR China. Oh, wonderful! Now, yeah. So, so I give the floor to Dario. <laughs> yes, go ahead. If you have any question to Richard. No, I just arrived. Uh, just uh, happy to to see Richard here. And uh, no, you uh, can speak about the translation, the Italian translation. Ah, the Italian translation of uh, TDR or, or in general or <laughs> his work, <laughs> the book. The book. Uh, it, it, it was uh, 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 necessary enterprises because the, the w of course the work of Richard is very well known in Italy, but uh, we we lack the. the, the the possibility to have uh, uh, the important performance studies and introduction uh, right. in our in our language in uh, in our country, and, uh, and then when I when we published this this book with uh, 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 a leader, a very important uh, uh, publishing house in, in Italy, which is called uh, Q Press. Uh, of course, the, there was a, a, a huge debate uh, all along the uh, Italian university on the uh, renewed debate on the Richard Schechner's work in Italy, on the PS perspective in Italy. And, uh, and I, I want just want to say thanks to, to Richard for giving me the possibility to, to make this work. It, it was a, a, a hard work to translate uh, PA, PA performance studies and introduction in Italy, uh, but I, I'm very, very grateful and very, and very glad to, 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 to do this work in Italy. So thanks, uh, Richard. Yes, well, I'm very glad that it's there, and I hope it does uh, stimulate lots of questions. Yes. Uh, I think we have uh, one more question from the floor by uh, Professor Mohamed Jalid. Would you please uh, come over? Yalla Jalid. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Khalid. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Uh, Shekna. Yes. Uh, in fact, I have uh, three uh, questions, and since the panel will will be finished in a few in a few minutes, I'm going to put them together. Uh, the first one focuses on your uh, article approaches to theory uh, criticism, which I, I have uh, the honor to 
translate into Arabic for the current Arabic TDR issue. Uh, in this article, you try to go beyond the Cambridge group assumption that uh, the origin uh, of the Greek uh, tragedy lies in uh, ancient Greek, Greek uh, uh, ritual. Uh, you say that no single ritual has uh, has been uncovered which contains all the elements of uh, either drama or the primal uh, uh, ritual. Is that why you tried to look for other sources or origins of performance in the primitive society's cultures, especially in the South? The second question, how does a ritual evolve into a, a performance? How would you distinguish a ritual and a, a performance? And uh, the, last, the last question, do you think there will be new performances in future? Uh, I mean, what are the issues that are not yet enacted uh, in performances uh, nowadays? Can can rituals be reinvented to re, uh, reinforce performance if it comes to a crisis? Have you ever, uh, finally, have you ever thought, thought of performance or a crisis in performance? Thank you. Thank you. Well, it will take uh, a long time to answer those very, very excellent and complex questions. Let me do a little bit. So, uh, long after I wrote appro uh, Approaches and uh, critiqued the Cambridge anthropologists, who were anthropologists uh, in their armchairs rather than anthropologists in the classic sense of going to uh, cultures not their own and participating and observing, long after that I did a lot of work on what I call paleo performance. What was going on? in the great in the caves of southwest europe and now we have found similar caves actually in indonesia in the island of Sulawesi. uh i'm talking about 25 30 thousand years before the present that is roughly uh 24 28 000 years before the greek tragedians and we know from the uh, uh cave paintings in places like lascaux and uh, many other uh, caves uh, that uh, something was going on there. Uh, I don't have the uh, chance now. There is in the uh, performance studies and introduction a whole chapter on on the uh, performances that were going on in these caves. They were not art galleries. They were very hard to access. The lighting was bad. You had to have torches. They were obviously doing uh, dances and and performances. Now. This meshes into your uh, next question. Uh, your next question: Were these dramas or were these rituals? The difference between drama, a theater, and ritual is a kind of scholarly difference. There isn't any real difference. It's the uh, social context. If you look, let's take let's take an Islamic ritual and let's take a Christian ritual. The Islamic ritual. Let's take the Hajj and the circulation in Mecca around the Kaaba. Uh, now that is obviously a very very important uh, uh, ritual uh, uh, e event. You make a journey supposedly at least once in your life. You then circa, you go around counterclockwise. Crowds are doing this all the time. And But the, it's a highly, if it's not theater in the dramatic sense. Drama is a special kind of theater. <clears throat> drama is theater that tells stories but theater that doesn't tell stories but that enacts actions are uh, is uh, to uh, is still performance so when you are participating in the Hajj you're doing a ritual but you are also uh, doing a performance you know if somebody came from Mars and looked down on that they would say what a great dance thousands of people in this huge circle around this uh, 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 thing. You can't even see the Kaaba. You have the black cloth covering it. How dramatic. What What is more beautifully dramatic 
than that. It's extraordinary, and it continues. If you turn to Roman Catholic ritual and the Eucharist, which is the core of the Roman Catholic, and somebody comes up to, and they are given a, a little uh, a wafer, a, a piece of bread, uh, uh, actually a matzot, uh, you know, a, a unleavened bread, and they say, and they take a bite of it, and they drink a sip of wine, and it said, "This is the flesh and body of Jesus Christ." It's transubstantiated and so on and so forth. So you either believe that or you don't believe that. But the point is that it's a ritual act which reenacts Christ's Last Supper. And Christ's Last Supper was a Passover Seder. His Last Supper, he came to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. And during that Last Supper, uh, where you're traditionally supposed to drink four glasses of wine, at the end of it, he raised a glass of wine, he took the matzot, he says, this is my flesh, this is my blood, and he shared that. So again, it, this from, from the point of view of the believing Catholic, this is a deep ritual. From the person from Mars, this is a drama. It reenacts what uh, 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 Jesus did, you know, at his Last Supper, and 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 prefigures his crucifixion. So there's a whole story that is uh, that is that is a dr dramatic story. I can go again and again and again and give these examples. That what's ritual and what's theater depends on your context, on how you place it, what point of view you take to it. If you are from the inside, it's a ritual because it is uh, enacting your belief. It's enacting your deeply felt values. If you're looking at it from the outside, as like anthropologists looked at, you, you use the word primitive, I would not use that word, but the performance of other uh, uh, people from the outside, these look like uh, theater works. From the inside, they are enacting their beliefs. Let's just take, from my point of view, what's going on right now. I see uh, Dario Tomasello leaning a little bit and he has his hand there, and, and there is uh, 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 Khalid, and in the background is a big picture of me. Uh, you know, a, the person coming from Mars would say, what an interesting movie this is. What's going on here? You know, and, and, and look, at, look at Dario's legs and his, his body gestures and how they're, so all of the, our, our actual behavior, we're always performing. The question is whether we want to pay attention to it. So sometimes we do not, uh, we do pay attention to it, like I've just done. Then you see that Dario is dancing and he's in a performance mode and, and Khalid is more relaxed and I'm in a kind of visually dominant position, but I'm not really there. So it's a kind of, uh, I'm a ghost of myself. But if we, so at that point, it's uh, a performance. Sorry, sorry, but at uh, another point, it's just what it is, uh, a discussion. Richard, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I think this behavior uh, must be distinguished from the twice behaved behavior. Oh, no, it, it's not to say it's not twice. It is twice behaved. I would say if we looked at it, just like every word I'm speaking, somebody has spoken before, not in that particular order. That's the point. We, there's no such thing from my, I don't want to get too deep into theory, but there's no such thing as an original. We're always, uh, we're genetically, we're reproducing the genes of our parents and our parents' parents in different combinations. And, and our evolution is this proliferation of repetition, of sameness and difference altogether. That, that's what I would like to help teach you. Okay, one more question, uh, and that's it. Yes. Test. Sabar khair. Suali bi khusus hudud tadakhul al-dakaa al-istinaai fi al-adaiya والفرجة والفوارق التي يمكن أن يخلق يخلقها ما بين الشمال والجنوب والسؤال الثاني بخصوص طابع القصدية عندما نتحدث عن فرجة نتحدث عن قصدية وعن فعل القصدي وعن تواطؤ ما بين الـ الـ يعني المؤدين والجمهور نقولهم هذا هذه فرجة بالنسبة للطقوس 
ليس هناك هذا الطابع القصدي عندما نعتبر الطقوس هي يمكن أن تكون فرجة لأننا لم نتعاقد على أن تكون هناك فرجة ولم نتعاقد عليها مع المشاهد يعني هذا هذا هو ريتشارد did you get that or shall I translate I, I, I would like that question rephrased or okay. comment. You know, I, I, I can translate. The first, uh, he has two questions actually. The first one, so he is asking about the, 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 the intervening of, let's say, artificial intelligence in, in performance. Will it inform and deform performance in the uh, future and the outcomes of it in the North and the South, given the disparities, inequalities between North and south in terms of you know access to internet and, and things like this that's the first question the second one mm, uh, uh, the second one it's it's about performance itself so i think there is a uh, there is a complete complicity when it comes to you know uh, between the uh, performer and the audiences you know uh, uh, in and uh, in terms of intentionality when uh, the performer says that I am here to perform for you but uh, he wants to draw a line between performance and ritual now I got it he wants to draw a line between performance and ritual and uh, he said that uh, in performance there is intentionality because there is a contract between the actor or the performer and the audience whereas in rituals there is no contract you know, people are involved in a very specific ritual, and uh, uh, literally, there are no no audiences. Is that okay. well? Uh, I I I don't. Uh, let me deal with them uh, uh, together. Uh, the internet is uh, becoming, or already is, pretty much uh, global. You go into the poorest parts of the world and you see people with their cell phones and uh, they will there there is going to be huge populations if we uh, survive as a uh, culture and a species that are going to jump over the uh, telephone era you know j jump in right into the AI era now uh, the question of AI is extremely complex they're already uh, our hours up. Uh, I don't know. I don't have an answer for it. Uh, TDR next issue of TDR is devoted to AI and performance. So I commend it to you. It, it will be out in about two months, and perhaps Khalid will take some of that and put it into Arabic. But AI poses a huge opportunity and a huge threat to human cultures uh, around the notion what is called the singularity. In other words, so I'll, I'll throw out one radical idea I have. We are used to life being carbon-based. We're uh, fighting now about uh, carbon emissions because we put out too much carbon into the atmosphere. But basically, uh, all life on the planet up to this point has been carbon-based. But now we have the possibility of a silicon-based life form. Doesn't need oxygen, doesn't eat uh, it, it, it's chips, et cetera, et cetera. At the point that AI can manufacture itself, and at the point that it is uh, uh, conscious and, and actually thinks, not just a compilation of what's put into it, because each individual human being is also a compilation of what is put into us, and we have our brain as our AI, but it's, a, it's not an AI, it's just an I, uh, and, and we are able to work with it. But when AI, the artificial intelligence, the artificial brain, is able to reproduce itself and think for itself, that will be a huge uh, opportunity, challenge, I don't know what. I, 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 I foresee it. I think I will probably be uh, dancing in the sky by that time. But it's something that we need to uh, consider and, and, and think about. As far as the last part, I think I answered that. I do not consider ritual and theater to be op opposed to each other. I think they're a question of, of analysis. I did write one essay 
which uh, is in my performance theory called From Ritual to Theater and Back, which I deal with that question extensively, and I commend that essay to your attention. Uh, I know we're near, we're past noon, and I want to say to uh, to uh, Khalid, to Dario, to all the others of you, you know, I, uh, I, I'm i happy to stay on, but I, I you have your conference to run. I'm so uh, glad to have participated this way, and I'm so sorry that I'm not there to have some... Uh, good Moroccan food and uh, to uh, go out and uh, have some tea and uh, coffee and all of that. So uh, uh, inshallah next time we shall be able to do it. Uh, and, but I'm glad that we've had uh, this opportunity and I, I send my support and my love to you. Thank you so much, Richard, for being with us even online, but definitely next year, inshallah, as you said. So physically you know we yes, really we, would we, like we, to welcome you to Morocco and take you we to, need, we need to Fez to. also you know I want to, I want to take you actually to Fez Marrakesh and uh, and visit. yes yes I, I hope that the recovery from the earthquake is proceeding yeah it's 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 going well and of course uh, you know uh, you will see uh, the different uh, you know, Marrakesh next time, certainly. Good. It's already Good. recovering, you know. The, the, uh, they just organized uh, the biggest uh, theater, uh, film festival in, in the Arab in world. In Marrakesh? In Marrakesh, yeah. Just oh, very recently, good. Yeah, just recently. So, yeah. so as they would say, I would say shukriya to you. <laughs> <laughs> shukriya, thank shukriya. You so thank you see. so much. See, see you, Richard. Bye. You. Bye. See you. Bye, Dario. Bye, see you. I'll see you in, I'll see After you in Israel. After you in Messina. Bye. Bye. Yes.